out. We want to make the um, recording available, but your your microphone is so sensitive that if you even squeak your chair or pick up a cup and set it down, um, it will pick up the recording. And when it does that, it turns me off and it flashes either your face or your phone number or you name across the screen and then I got to have somebody go in there and put the ACE logo over over it after the fact so um, if you could when it she's going to mute everybody co-host Amory is going to mute everybody and then when you want to talk you can unmute yourself the hard part is when you're done talking to remember to go back on mute. But I think Anne Marie's gonna be able to, um, to help with that. So um, having talked about mute quite a bit, what I thought I would do this time is um, hopefully everybody read the article and I'm gonna pull the article up on screen this time. And so it might help jog your memory, but I thought before I would start, I would ask for general questions first since you've already had the material and um, that might steer me to stay exactly where you want me. And we're hoping to go for about an hour. So any general impressions or aha moments or what the heck is she talking about moments um, uh, from reading the article that you want to throw out there to start? Well, this is Kate. It, it made me realize how often I'm kind of um, uh, messing up what I'm training just in my day-to-day, -day, you know, walks and, and interactions with the dog that aren't, you know, technical training. Um, so did you see some things when you were walking that you're like, ooh, this doesn't always mean that in agility? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, I think, I think things like, um, you know, when I'm when I'm doing things like making them stay at the door or making them stay for, you know, if there's a dog across the street and and then releasing on motion. I think things like that rather than sticking with the, you know, don't really always, uh, you know, being so so still. So I think things like that, and then also just playing and the examples you gave in with. Um, you know, just playing and throwing the ball and, and really kind of build, probably building confusion around the, the whole D cell and, and go on stuff. So things like that. The thing of it is, is we don't really know what conclusions they're drawing. We all know for sure that their learning is situational, right? We all know that our dogs you know, can tell when we're going one place or going another. And it, and if we if we just, just started laughing about that and talking about that, what our dogs know, oh, he knows that or he knows this, we would realize that it's happening, it's happening all the time. But in training, unfortunately, we don't always get a crystal clear message until it's too late. Um, and And a lot of times what handlers unfortunately do is they don't put the two and two together and that's what I'm hoping the article will do is to just at least make you think if my dog knew this and now it seems like he doesn't know it before you jump on the he's blowing me off bandwagon you might think what else am I doing in everyday life that could possibly be making this dog think that this doesn't apply in every situation. Once we start saying this rule happens in this situation and that rule happens in that situation, not saying I, ha I don't have anything where the dog has learned a distinction. I'm just saying the more I mess with it and the more I open it, the more I have to be willing to accept the dog's natural conclusion. Anybody else, Julie? Did you have a, a question? 
if your speaker's activated, a yellow line will go around you. So that's why sometimes- I'm still trying to get on and get all my stuff organized. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Okay. Um, anybody else with a general comment like that, an aha moment or anything that was like, hey, I really didn't get that. That's what I would really like to hear if there was a part. Hopefully, if we keep doing these, you guys, will, when you're reading, you'll highlight things and you'll you'll come up with. Otherwise, I'll just go through the article. So let me know now. Do we have anybody else that wants to say something before we get going? Um, can you hear me? This is Amy. I can, Amy, yes. I realized that in the morning when I let my dog out of his crate, I just let him walk out. Oh, oh, oh be still my beating heart. <laughs> um, that's so cool. That's so cool. I was, I was just ran up to the park to play with my puppy. And, um, you know, he's one, so his conclusions are just, it's wonderful. He's just drawing all kinds of conclusions all the time. And he's got great crate manners. I mean, he had crate manners before he had a name. But I was at the park, and I was at a part where I had never been, and I opened up the door, and I, and the routine was just a little bit different. Like I sort of had my back to him and I was swinging the ball and I started saying, you want your ball, you want your ball. And he flew out of the crate. And, uh, and my marker word is nope. And, uh, and I was amazed at how fast he flew back in. I mean, we play crate games a lot. And then he, we went through the whole thing and he, you know, he, I did exactly what I did before. I gave him half of my back. I twirled my ball. I said, you want your, and I couldn't even get the word ball out. And he was like, pshoom, out of the crate again. And I said, nope. And he, and now, now he's in like, well, this is cool because I'm still getting to run. I'm running back and forth. Um, and then he did the, the classic thing. And this, the fun part, you guys, for me, is I'm looking for it. I don't expect my dogs to be perfect. And I love training. So if you don't expect your dogs to be perfect and you love training, you're golden because then you're just going to live in this place of curiosity of, you know, how did I get that instead of this irritated, he shouldn't do that or he should know that. I mean, for one thing, I knew I had never been, my car had never been parked in that exact spot and I had never been walking away quite that nonchalantly because he's one and he's a terrier border collie mix. And I wouldn't, had it, ever, you know, twir it's just that that was a unique scenario. So that's his opportunity to go, oh, is this, hello, question, is this the one time that I, that there's no, that I, we don't do what we normally do? So I said, nope, again. And then <laughs> I stopped and I, you know, turned my back a little, good boy. I brought the ball up, good boy. I gave it one wheel, good boy. I said, you wanna without wheeling the toy, good boy. So I broke it down for him. And, uh, and then he did the one paw out. <laughs> and that's nope again, cause our rules are both feet in. So he was just saying, I'm just asking, how about this, how about this, how about this? Nobody's feelings were hurt, nobody's mad at anybody. He's like, I need, I want some reminders. And I'm like, cool, I'm a teacher. I got all day. And, um, and we worked through it and I got exactly what I wanted. I walked away from the car. I twirled my ball. It just took a minute. He got crystal clear. He was real excited and happy with himself that he got the message. I think dogs really dig communicating with us. And when we start communicating on high levels with them without the, you know, I have to stop and teach you now. Um, that they really do uh, like rising to the challenge. So noticing that uh, for those of you that don't know um, about my pet peeve about moving on release, um, with contact training with stays, I start all of my stay work with, because I want the release word to be a verbal, I don't move simultaneously with my release word when my dogs are learning their release word. And with my contacts, I work very, very hard to have no motion because if I'm moving simultaneously with anything, I mean, that's how we teach a drop on recall. We teach the word down and then we combine a signal. So um, that's where Kate went with that. She's noticed that she's simultaneously um, moving when she's releasing out in the real world. And then, um, uh, uh, 
those were both real good classic examples. The feet in the crate is a good one. Like when I wrote about that in the article, when do feet matter? Anybody else with an aha or a confusion moment about the article? How many of you are dying to get to the D cell drill? <laughs> one, one, a couple brave souls there. <laughs> the chat, the chat light is flashing. All right. Well, let's. Um, I'm going to go to screen sharing, and uh, you should see the article. And if the um, if you've got little boxes and people covering up part of the article, you've got a minimize block at the top of that. So you can minimize it. And, um, you know, Anne Marie, I'm not 100% sure that I can still see chat. You want to send me a message and see if I can? I can see, sorry guys, hang in there with me. Yes, I can. It's a little bit awkward to get to it, but we can do it. All right, perfect. All right, so we pretty much went into, I was looking at how I can highlight things. We pretty much went into this um, whole keeping the, con the training concept alive. And um, the things that the, the article I wrote from a D cell standpoint because of what happened in the class that I wrote about. So we're doing this D cell drill. And to me, you guys, I have what I call um, basic core communications, fundamental golden rules, like. I try really hard to never mess with D cell because that's what off courses are. Off courses are dogs ignoring you and stealing obstacles. If your dogs take off and steal obstacles, when you're cueing them to respond to you and they're not responding to you, you got to get clear about what your cues are. So if I'm stopped and calling here and my dog is ignoring that, it's because I have taught him that those cues do not apply in certain situations. Once we open that can of worms to a dog, it is up to the dog then for however long they need it to be before you straighten out your communication to test, to ask, is it now? Is it now the exception? Is it now? And people think that that's, they call it stubborn, they call it naughty, they call it all kinds of things, but it's never anything less than confusion and exceptions. If there were no exceptions, the dogs would not have the questions. So we're doing this, this D cell drill in class. And, um, and then the next week, somebody leads out, it was this, this um, uh, heinous crime here that happened somebody let out to the end of a row of jumps and put their reinforcement here and they didn't move. So they're standing still. They're happy that the dog held the stay. They're happy that the dog waited for the release and then sprung and they're happy that the dog did four jumps, but then the dog, this was where the plant, the red one, the R1 was where the reinforcement was. So, all of this work that we had done the week before was pretty much ruined. Um, I mean, was it ruined forever and ever? Heck, I don't know. It depends on what breed of dog it was how or how often that's happening, really. You guys, I don't believe one or two goofs is going to spoil anything, but most people aren't. If you're not aware, you're not making one or two. So... Um, uh, any questions about this number before we go back to, and I, we, I get you, get you some D cell lessons here. Is there any questions about why this green ball is correct and the red ball isn't? No? Okay. So why would anybody lead out to right there? 
The only real reason would be if there was another jump where this arrow is. So if there was another jump here, you'd be doing a lead out pivot. And the lead out pivot is completely, I see I've got a question. Uh, thank you. Um, I can monitor this. Feel free to unmute yourself to participate. Oh, that's to everybody. <laughs> I thought, oh, I'm not, <laughs> I hope I'm unmuted. Thanks, Anne Marie. Um, so this would be for lead out pivot training. If I wanted the dog to turn tight on four, I would have led out to where the cursor is now. If I wanted the dog to turn tight on three, I would lead out to where the cursor is now. Two, I would be standing, whoops a daisy, I'd be standing right there. So the only time I would be leading out to this point, which is a little bit weird without having another jump to show over here, would be if I wanted the dog to turn and land in this lane. You guys, if I was standing here where the arrow is, the green ball would be wrong because I would be giving the dog only this lane to turn in. So whatever space your past on the last jump is the space that your dog is allowed to take. So if I was doing, there was a jump right here and this was a 180, I wouldn't be this far up. I'd be right next to that next number five jump. So, so now say I was just gonna lead out to here and there was another jump over here. As long as I'm, and, my, and I have my reinforcement where the red is, as long as I start moving before this position right here cues D cell for four, it cues, a collection stride to happen before four. It's telling the dog you're gonna turn this tight. If I was standing here, the dog would have to collect, stay on the ground longer, much longer to turn here. So um, if I was going forward, all I would have to do, this would be the information zone for four, is I would have to start moving when the dog is before one, before two, or before three. And then I'm perfectly legal, as long as I'm showing that movement. It has nothing to do with who gets there first. Any questions? And are you saying go on at that point? If they're gonna, they're gonna drive to red, right? Yeah, once they're gonna pass me, if I'm moving, I may pass them. I'm usually, um, would it be wrong to say go on if the dog was behind you? No, it wouldn't be wrong. It wouldn't be breaking anything. Um, normally, because I work so hard with go on to mean um, don't look back at me, that's my primary use of it. I don't really have a, have a need. If I wanted to enhance my go on um, verbiage, it, there would be nothing wrong with saying it. And this would be a real good way to handle questions, Anne Marie, if you just ask them to me instead of having me go to the to the um, screen. So I want to make sure you guys understand this number three. So I think what we'll do is we'll just look at the drill um, together from one on. Um, I do want to talk. I believe that we, so it, I believe that we covered this pretty good, but I'm just gonna make sure um, when I talk about the dogs, you know, they learn to stay by us, they learn to, to respect Diesel when they're tiny, but then once they're just running wherever they wanna go. So, so if my dog is running towards something and I wish they weren't, <laughs> Would I still be saying go on? With a tiny puppy, I might be, as long as he's not going to get run over, eat something's going to kill him. Um, uh, and I don't advertise, when I've lost control, I don't advertise it. So the last thing I'm going to do if a dog is running toward a squirrel or someone with a hot dog or one of their favorite people, which would be my mom at our house, I'm not going to be... Um, frantically trying to get them if my recall isn't in place. And that could, might be something that somebody has a question about after. So the real life versus the training life. Um, 
and we've already had a couple people noticing uh, feet are the common one, and then this this running away, running towards too. I'm always cheerleading when my dogs are. I'm using um, come on, come on, come on, come on, woohoo, woohoo, cheerleading style um, voice when my dogs are running towards me because I can pair myself, my voice with my dogs as they're heading toward me. Um, and that's whether I've called them or not. So you guys, I talk a little bit here um, at this part about the art of restraint. And um, I love doing restraints to obstacles, to toys, to um, mark buckets, to anything the dog wants. And there is a, a lot of people want to pull back and forth and shake the dog and th they don't like it. Haven't seen that dog yet that likes that shaking rocking them back and forth. When I'm doing what I call the art of restraint, it's like I have um, springs in the dog's shoulders and my fingers are slowly loading the spring. So when you're loading a spring, you're not in and out, in and out, in and out. It's one direction. And then, and a lot of times the dog will be like, oh, okay, you don't want me to go. And they'll lean back with you and that's not what you want you want to feel that dog that opposition reflex kick in it's real fun with puppies and then you feel them start well i don't want to be back this far and they start to lean into your fingers and then you spring your hands open and that's the point that i say go on go on go on in that nice flat inspiring staccato tone so I'm not using my release word. I didn't say stay, I didn't say sit, I didn't say down. It's not a release, it's an action. And in the picture of, the, um, of Jojo with Linda there, Jojo's sitting and I really, if I had to check a box, I would check my preference would be standing. But her fingers, where her fingers are on those shoulder blades are perfect. And this is something I wouldn't show to a dog the first time they're in front of obstacles. This would be something I would do to toys or food um, to get them. And the, you know, and I'm using my voice too. You know, I my voice would sound like you ready, <gasps> steady, and I'm building depending on how much spice I need from that dog. Another dog, it may just be no voice if the dog is, is um, getting too excited to where they're not going to think. So art and the, and the general art of restraint. I, I rarely teach a lesson where I'm having somebody restrain the dog that we don't need to go there, that I don't think they could be doing it a little better. <laughs> okay, so before I teach D cell, what I want to do is have that dog just flying down that row of jumps. So I don't want them thinking about D cell. I want them to think, go, 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 get your thing. Go, 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 get your thing. If you don't have control over reinforcement, you're going to need a treat and train, or you're going to need um, uh, something, a your food or your toy in a container. And recently, I have fallen absolutely in love with mark buckets. And um, the thing about the mark buckets, we've got, we're going to have a class come out on it real soon. It's a fun, happy place for the dog to go and park himself. And you don't have to worry about him stealing the toy or they're way less likely to dive around the jumps to steal because their their brain is more engaged. It's, it's going to my thing. If I had trouble with the dog, whether I was using the mark bucket or the planted toy or the planted food or the treat and train, as I would back chain. So I'm not expecting the dog to just go over four jumps. I would back chain directly to the thing and then put them on takeoff side of four and back chain. And I would be mindful of how high the jumps were and the spacing of the jumps. And that would be something you would get from all the sources that talk about proper jump shoot uh, heights and, and sizes. That's another, that's another seminar and not my specialty. So um, the point here is, is I'm trying to show, I like when I'm teaching something to show the dog the opposite. 
So it's like, this means this, and that means that, and they're the opposite. So I'm teaching the dog some extension. That 12 to 15 feet from that reinforcement on that last jump's a bit tight. That'd be it for a tiny dog. So your bigger dogs, your polars, your border collies, that could be way out 20, 18 feet, 17 feet. Um, so that's just your contrast. We're just getting them used to it. And then, and then it's test time. So you guys, when you're asking your dogs questions, you don't have to be afraid of the answers. <laughs> I, it, when you're on a fact-finding mission, be, just let the dog tell you. And you don't have to take his first response, but everybody wants to cheat and they think they're helping and they're they're really not and you when you cheat when you start leaning or twisting or whispering or changing the cue on every single rap you're 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 acting like your dog isn't smart and they find it offensive um it don't start changing things up until it's time to change things up and you make the decision. All of that little cheating stuff that you do um, turns into cues and then it makes the dog look at you harder and then you're grasping at what little cheating thing will get you what you want. And it's never gonna be a cue in the end anyway, so why the heck do you want your dog to learn that is the thing to respond to? So what I'm trying to teach the dog here is simple. It's don't pass me if I'm stopped, period, end of story. So if I start adding little shoulder twitches or whispers or leg pads, if I start adding that stuff, I'm no longer teaching that the cue is that I'm holding still. So what a lot of dogs will do is, depending on how much heel work they've had to be honest with you you guys if you've done a lot of heel work with your puppies they do start to get to get the picture that they eat a lot when they're next to you so on the first rep of this in class we just um released the dogs and stood facing the reinforcement and let the dog do whatever they wanted. If you have a helper down there that can pick up the reward, I would not have my reward unguarded. That's where the treat and train comes in handy. And the, the um, mark tub makes that a little bit easier too. So, um, and then, so some dogs are gonna take three, some dogs are gonna take four. And the question is, what are you gonna do if they don't go all the way to the reward and they come back? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So on a first rep, I would congratulate that dog. Woohoo! you are thinking about me. You didn't think about me when I wanted you to, but you are thinking about me, but no enchilada. So I'm not gonna give the cookies that are on me. So I'm gonna give that dog, you guys, four or five tries, not two. I used to just do like two tries. And I thought if the dog can't do it, hold on just a second, that's enough. If the dog can't do it in two tries, then he doesn't know it, he doesn't know it. But what I'm finding out in my training these days is that dogs can often come up with the right answer if they're given a little bit more of a chance than two reps. I have very few students that learn anything in two times. <laughs> They need a few more chances. So I would let that dog make that quote unquote mistake as many times as he wanted. If I got up to around five straight reps and that dog was accelerating faster past me, or you know, there was like no light bulb, no, no message, nothing, then I would start doing some of the stuff I talked in the article. I would rotate my shoulder toward the dog. I would make hard eye contact. Those are real D cell cues. Those are not cheating, helping hints, cheater trying to get the dog to just do what I want. Eye contact is begets eye contact. That is a cue I use in the sport. Rotating into the dog is a cue that I use in the sport. So, um, but that dog would make the mistake five times. Do you wanna know how many dogs just keep blowing by their handlers five times? Almost none, almost zero. I mean, I'm, I might even, 
I don't know that I have seen a dog actually have so little awareness of their handler that they just keep accelerating past their handler. So this is, and you guys, this is the type of thing where <laughs> I'll, I'll ask people, um, you know, can you do this? And they'll say, well, I, I think he will. You've either trained it or you haven't. I mean, it's cool to say, it's cool to go there a little bit and say, I, I've done other D cell things and he might, but this is way, way, way um, hard stuff. And if you haven't done some type of getting the dog to understand when you are on takeoff side of the jump, this is very different than being right next to the jump. I am clearly on the takeoff side of the jump. So um, I would just let this dog figure it out. I would not get irritated. And um, the first time that he didn't take three, I would give the reward, even if he got close to it. And then I would be, and then the first time that he actually collected, stayed on the ground, collected, whether or not I had to rotate, whether or not I had to make eye contact, whether or not I had to do both. And again, the only dog that's gonna need that amount of help that isn't gonna just be able to figure it out after about five reps, is gonna be a dog who has had a lot of ignore my D cell cue training. A lot of standing at the park and running for the ball, a lot of blowing by the handler um, without permission. And yep. There's a question on Cindy. Um, Iris is asking if you can talk a little bit more about heel work and how you would train how the heel work can help or hurt the D cell concept the um, for helps, young dogs and it, in particular. Yeah, and, it, and that, um, you know, there's so many different ways to teach heel. My basic favorite is the dog's shoulders level with the seam of my pants, and they eat a lot of food there. And the other tip for healing, you guys, is to not let the dog push your hand forward. So this is just regular old walks. I stop, you stop. And um, I walk, you walk, stop and go with walking. You can do this with baby puppies. So, um, and we're a little bit out of scope getting into, um, but heels, just lots of food at the side of your leg. And, it, and I like to have my hand touching my leg. I'm also, I'll just throw this in for the heck of it. Um, I started about a year ago. I don't reward my dogs for recalls coming in front of me anymore. I suppose if I was still doing competition obedience, I, um, I might, and, um, uh, but now I just have my dogs on when I'm hiking. I love it. I just have them come and swing around to my side. So they're always going in the direction I'm going. And that's much more useful for regular hiking and agility. So that's a little bit off topic too, for those of you that can visualize. I'm just, my dogs are flying towards me for recall. My hand is at my side with the cookie and they've learned to swing their butt around to the lineup. Um, and again, out of scope a little bit here. So um, the very first time the dog puts in the amount of collection I want, and you guys, that's something you'll have investigated on your own. So I want you to have three ideas in your brain about this collection business. And, and it, you got to train your eye. You got to be kind to yourself when you're training your eye. Your dog is going to land in a fabulous spot. You got it nice and tight. He stayed on the ground longer. He, he left the ground closer to the jump. He rotated nicely and he landed tight. And those are going to be exceptional. You're going to pay every single one of those. And then you're going to have really crappy ones. A dog's going to leave. Um, as soon as he lands, he's going to try to bounce, jump it. He, uh, <laughs> leaving, <laughs> we can fool ourselves into thinking it's where the dog lands that matters. It's actually where they take off. So if your dog takes off way, 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 way too soon and peaks his arc way too soon and he happens to land close to the jump on the other side, but only because he took off too early, that's not what you're training here. You're training the dog to actually stay on the ground till he's right up to the jump, collecting up and popping over the bar. And that's 
easier said than done for some dogs than others. And that is another training session. That's something you would contact me privately. How do I teach the dog to stay on the ground longer? Um, in a nutshell, I stand closer to the jump than the picture shows and I pay the dog for coming to my leg and I pay them for popping over the jump. And I've got a couple of other drills that I do to teach them those mechanics of popping over the jump while they're turning. So that's important. Your, your dog needs to know how to do that physically. And so you've got these two things right off the bat. You've got this beautiful dog stayed on the ground. He put the brakes on as soon as he landed. He added those extra stride or two nice and tight. He knew what he was doing with his body. He lofted over and turned and landed and you're thrilled and you knew it was perfect and you could see the whole thing. Then you've got he left way early. He, um, it's the leaving that matters, not where he lands, but if he left, uh, early, there's a good chance he landed way far out. The other place he's going to land is straight. He's not going to, he's not going to have turned. He's going to land like an arrow opposed to a noodle. So when they're turning, when they're preparing to turn on approach, so they're turning, then landing opposed to landing and then turning. So you'll know those are ugly and they're wide and you'll roll your eyes. and You're like, oh, that was way too wide. So those two are the easy ones to judge. Now there's the gray. You're not sure. He sort of slowed down, but it didn't look like the stride he put in before. And it's sort of not exactly what you want, but it was better than the last one, do you pay? You guys, this is the tricky part where you gotta know your dog. One, you gotta know how hard that is for his body. How much effort is he putting in? Because if he's putting in a tremendous amount of effort and the, and the, and the other ones were terrible, yeah, he's gonna, you're going to have to say you're on the right track. If you keep paying what you're feeling is mediocre, he's not going to have the incentive to tighten it up a little bit more. So you will have to go back to, um, to say, now I need you to collect up a little bit more, maybe pain on the takeoff side of the jump a little bit more. So what to reward and what not to gets tricky. But if you've got these, I know that was great. I know I always reward that. I know that's completely unacceptable. I'm never going to reward that. Then you're going to have two more ranges and they're going to be acceptable and unacceptable. And this is how I judge all my, my jump training. If it's terrible, I'm not paying. If it's unacceptable, I'm only paying if it was a major improvement for a, like a Malinois that can't hardly turn or a Whippet. Um, and then those acceptable ones, I'm gonna pay some of those depending how much momentum so there's a big difference between the dog putting on the brakes and turning tightly on two, harder on three because of more momentum, even harder on four because of more momentum. So this drill does have to be done at each of the jumps. And what I started to say is the first time that light bulb goes on, you see that dog really thinking that he wants to be a noodle you see him preparing to be a noodle. He's not leaving the ground and gonna land like an arrow on the other side. And you see all that happening. You can give him a double reward. As soon as he comes ar around, you're rotating. You can, um, you can pay on your leg and rotate or you can just pay him straight on. The article says to pay right then and there. Don't rotate. Then you rotate put him backwards over one. So you've done a figure eight. That's what this, this is what this is happening here. So the dog did one and two, turned tight, the handler front crossed, let the dog have this jump, front crossed again, and then immediately went into go on, go on, go on, go on. And the handler is showing the movement following the dog. How fast does the handler have to run? How important is it? As long as you're moving, as long as you're moving at the same rate. So you could actually be jogging or walking fast. What I wouldn't do is start walking 
and then change my speed. So I can be following the dog down there. So that's like he's, he's turned tight, he gets another turn tight. So he got the reward definitely for turning tight on two. I wouldn't reward three. The reward for coming around three is nose at, at um, right here. So he, he's, this is the dog here. He goes around, his nose is right here at the refusal line and you can break into go on, go on, go on, go on. And then he gets this reward too or lands on his mark, which you would run up in jackpot, get real excited. So this is fun, then you get to the two tight turns out of it. Um, what, there's a bad thing that gets taught here. I don't think, I, I, like, to, I like to torture my students with stuff like this, like what is the bad thing that could be happening with this drill? Um, I'll give you a hint. It's not, it has nothing to do with the dog. What's the bad thing that a handler would be learning from this drill? Can anybody, can, I'll, I'll give you a minute. What would, I kind of said it, I kind of, I opened the can. So you can type or you can speak up. Anne Marie, you want to just give them to me? I have a guess if nobody else has a guess. <laughs> okay. My, my, well, my guess is, you know, after you do the front cross at two and they take and they, and they go back to three, you're actually teaching them a, ba a back jump. Okay, so um, that drawing does, so that, air, good point, because you would absolutely not have that dog back jump. So that arrow is for one. And it oh, and the blue okay. arrow that that should have been fixed. That so that dog, let me draw it. I want that dog to go over one, over two, around three, and then the dog should not back jump. The dog should come around here and go on this line. Oh gotcha. And then take two, the three, four. Confusing. Gotcha. Yeah, the picture's confusing. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, don't teach your dogs to back jump. Back jumping would be if the dog took one, took two, took three, and then took one again. Yeah, the dog should go on the outside of figure eight. Good, good catch. Anybody else know what I wouldn't, what's the problem with the handler? Feet first. If you don't know the answer to this, you need to sign up for feet first. It's only $30. <laughs> then it's happening now. I'd go to clean run. Jen, I know you're in the audience. You going to go for it? Pat, do you want to go for it? You, you girls are going to get uh, beat up if... <laughs> Gwen, Lonnie, Linda. All right, I'll help. Not you. speaking up. <laughs> but do you know? Tuxedo heard your voice. All right, guys, I'll give you. So those of you that know my information zone, when your dog is between one and two, the good timing of the front cross would be that the front cross is done before the dog lands. So when I teach D cell like this, and I'll tell you what, when I got when I got obsessed with feet first, um, I one of the things, you guys, how many, if there's one thing every handler has heard from every um, <laughs> method by every instructor is you're late. You're late, you're late, you're late. I think timing, is the single most difficult element of this sport. I mean, nobody says I have impeccable timing all the time. <laughs> nobody. If I if I have a course where I think I got, I mean, I mean, I asked Greg Darrett once. I'm like, how many times on how many courses do you run that you feel like your timing and your cues were every single one on the course? And he said, like, probably never. 
I mean, agility is like golf. It cannot be perfected. But I do have guidelines for myself for timing, and I do try to have all of my turn cues completed before the dog lands. So when I started examining why is it that timing is so elusive to so many handlers, because, I mean, it's just too much. That This is one of the reasons. Um, if you teach D-cell like this, you're practicing. The handler is practicing bad timing because in an effort to teach the dog to not turn tightly because of a turn cue, to teach the dog to simply turn tight because of D-cell alone, you're practicing bad timing. Even if you do the rotation on two. Now you could say, I'm gonna, uh, and, and those of you who train with me when we do single stanchion work, which I'll be starting um, fancy timing right in pre-agility, right from the get-go. My handlers are gonna be getting, learning to leave stanchions before the dog has gotten all the way around it to, to teach good timing. I still like, uh, so when I first started putting all these things together, it's like, maybe I don't wanna teach D-cell like that anymore. Maybe I will just teach the front cross. Um, but I wanted that comprehension, guys, and I couldn't, I couldn't have both. I couldn't put my turn in there right off the bat and have the dog simply, I couldn't say, oh, ignore the full body rotation and now I'm facing a new direction. So this is what I do. I teach this D-cell cue like this and I'm fully aware that I personally am practicing by standing still and watching my dog take a jump by not cueing the new direction because I would never be on takeoff side of that jump if I was going forward. So that's another religion there. That's another, that's another absolute, I'll be with you in just a second, Anne-Marie. That's another absolute decel on takeoff side of the jump. I never mess with that. If I am on decel on the takeoff side of the jump, the dog is wrapping that stanchion. And boy, howdy, I can't think of an exception to that. I would be, I, I just don't think I could do it. I just don't think I could, that there would be any reason that I would uh, mess with that. So what you're doing is you're teaching the dog the D-cell cue, and then the day comes where the dog knows it. And unless you've got a problem down the road and you need to go back and say, hey, pal, if I'm stopped on takeoff, you do, you collect. It is a collection cue. And then the $100,000 question is, when does your dog need you stopped? And most handlers, many handlers, um, think that it is later um, than it is. You need to be up there and stopped pretty early for them to see it, respond to it, get their strides in and wrap. They need some time to adjust their bodies. What was the question, Anne Marie? Uh, Jules is asking about whether or not you use a verbal in the drill. I'm no. guessing that's a collection. No, that's a good question, and and we go on to that in the article. Um, so that's why I'm not rotating too. I'm teaching pure one thing, pure. This is a training session. This is not how I would handle. So once I get the dog understanding that I'm not even rotating, I'm, not, I'm trying to not even make eye contact. I'm trying to give the dog nothing but a stopped body on takeoff. Because if I can get the dog understanding that that's real, real, real important, then if I don't have all the, you guys, what I don't want to do, there's so many ways we can help our dogs. There's so many cues that I want to be able to teach the cues all for the same thing separate. And then when I'm in the heat of battle in competition, I can combine them all and have like superpowers. So I will add that verbal, but after I've got the behavior, I will absolutely name that D, 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 D is my collection. Some people use rap, 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 rap. Some people use dig, dig, dig. So once I've trained the dog, and I will also teach eye contact so that if that is a tunnel, if number three, um, well, number in this one, it's number six, five. Uh, if number five is a tunnel and I need that, I'm you know, figure eighting those two jumps, 
I can do eye contact and ding, 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 and rotate on approach. And then I'm going to get that tight turn. The, the dog doesn't want to tight turn. Dog wants to go in the tunnel. So it's just extra power. Is there another question for me? Nope, not so much. Not so now. Okay. Um, we talked about being in the park and the go on, go on, go on with the ball. So I'm doing that. I don't stand still and throw the ball without saying go on, go on, go on. Even if I haven't put the dog on a sit, even if I'm just doing a, um, a classic throwing the ball, you know, he brings it back, I throw it again, he brings it back, he throw it again. Most of the time I am doing stays, you guys, most of the time I'm doing downs, lefts, rights, they're working for the ball. But every time I'm standing still and my dog is going away from me, I know what the other one is. Um, I'm saying go on. The other kiss of death that I see way too much in um, classes is at the end of the drill, the handler throws the ball and stops moving. You can't, you can't have that and that. You can't have what I have with D-cell meaning that much. And then on course, it makes me sweat and get lightheaded to think about it. You don't, that's the last thing you want to do is stop and throw something. That's, just, that's saying when I stop, you go faster. So if you're throwing toys at the end of a run, you should be saying, go on, go on, go on, and moving until your dog's um, mouth is on the toy. That's the rule in my classes. You can shut up when your mouth is on the toy. Now, do you, so like Linda here in the picture, and this, this here, so this is worth talking about, because Linda's staying there and just saying, go on, go on, go on. How much... So go on, go on, go on means ignore me. So how much of that is it to your benefit to teach your dog? It's, it's up to your dog. I mean, I teach go on, go on, go on. I cannot have, I can't get master's gambles in USDAA without holding still and having the dog race by me. Exactly what I'm saying I don't want. So the go on is permission to ignore D-cell. So how much do I, it, does it matter? Can I just practice that all I want? I don't really think I can. I teach it just enough to have it. I make sure it's strong. I test it from time to time. But if I'm standing around going, go on, go on, go on more than I should be, I'm gonna have a problem. My dog will tell me, I will recognize it and I will tip those scales. Uh, back and not do that quite so much. Did we have a question? Yeah, Fanny, I'm going to unmute Christine. Okay. Oops, I think I'm going to unmute her. She may have to do it herself too. It oh, may I have see. To be a team effort. Christine, yeah, go ahead and unmute. Actually, ac thank you, Anne Marie. I actually had a question quite some time ago and was trying to figure out how to get it posted and you answered it already. Oh. So thank you. <laughs> okay. You don't got another one? What was it? No, it was, um, if this was a way, is this how you teach D cell to uh, a young dog? And you, you said yes, that you do use this to teach D cell. It, the, it's how I teach the dog to respond to me, but it's not how I teach the mechanic of the dog's body. So this would oh. not be the first, I'm glad you said that. I know what, I know that's not what you, um, what you meant, but I, and I did mention it, but I want to reiterate, you guys wrapping those stanchions and wrapping those wings. And I was recently talking um, to um, a, a friend, Dev, about something that my friend Becky, they're both here today, had taught me a while back ago about some of these difficulties, these bigger well, really any dog. It's not just, I don't want to, um, I will be teaching my next dog to go around barrel-like objects to get a little bit more. Uh, Gwen, we're going to do this with your puppy too. Um, I bought some round pop-up clothes hampers 
um, to help the dogs bend a little bit more, to use, you know, um, to use their bodies a little bit more. And then the teaching of the going around something, um, trees or whatever, um, you can, uh, you want the dog to have that skill without jumping. And then you want the dog to have that skill with a very low bar. So the dogs have learned, they just haven't learned how to respond to it. And then how much momentum you put in makes a hell of a big deal to the dog as to the, the, the level of difficulty. We're at, um, we're at five o'clock. So we've been talking for about an hour and I am good to stay. Um, uh, I, the point of the article, the why I call that training insurance, is if you are going to train your dogs to respond to this D cell cue, this isn't easy, especially if you've got reinforcement setting out there. And especially if you've just told the dog, go on, go on, go on, and patterned him to open up down that row of jumps. So my entire point that I want you to get today is that it's not easy to do. And if you go messing around, if you say you spell cat, you know, C-A-T today, but tomorrow it's K-A-T, you're not going to be able to rely on it. And if you can't rely on it, what's the point of putting all this effort in? This is a fair, this, this cue, decel on takeoff side of a jump is my bread and butter, man. I have been banking on this baby with the last five dogs. I'll never do without it. It is bread and butter, but I protect it. I am not going to be standing still letting my dogs blow by me. There's no reason. And I, I've had people, well, my dog doesn't seem to get mixed up with, well, goody gumdrop for you, but he might someday. And if I don't have to go there, why should I, why shouldn't I just always be doing everything to strengthen it? And I think part, another place I would like to take people that work with me is really understanding which cues are, do really need to be insured to a very high point and which ones are a little bit more flexible. And I just started a new art series in Clean Run, um, three jump, four jump, for you, you, those of you that know my one jump, two jump work, um, that was a whole thing on everything you can teach on one jump and two jump, which is really just about everything, including distance and lead outs and 180s and 270s and threadles and SERPs. And now I'm adding the next two um, jumps and um, coming up with recognizing configurations and coursework. And I say, you know, judges will modify configurations. So sometimes they're not easy to spot if the obstacles are angled or if it's different obstacles, they can be really hard to spot. And the thing about having rules in your training is if the modification, if the judge has modified a classic um, uh, configuration, what you're, how you're going to handle it may be different, but the way you handle another configuration is going to back you up because you can just go to another way you dog understands how you handle new configuration that the modification is mimicking or making change. So I know I went out there a little bit, so it'll, you know, re, re sign up for clean run and get those configuration articles because they're going to start pretty quick. Was there another question for me, Anne-Marie? Yeah, Connie is asking that when you're playing uh, in the park uh, and you're playing the ball, uh, the verbal go on, does that tend to overuse go on? It can, but I don't have a choice. That's an excellent question. So you guys, a lot of times in training, I don't get ideal. Ideal isn't on the menu. If I'm at the sushi bar, spaghetti ain't on the menu. So if I've decided to play ball, I'm not gonna chase the dog. I'm not gonna chase the dog. So my only other um, point, it, it, it's just the absence of ignoring it. So could you train go on too much? Yes, especially if you're not training any tight stuff. So what I do is, here's the real answer to balancing that um, long road homes on that one. Sorry, guys. You could do a bunch of go on, go ons, and then you could pat your leg, have some cheese in your hand and do close, 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 and do some 360s and pay the dog for staying on your leg. And then throw the ball a couple more times, do your go on, go on, go on, and then close, 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 and then the other side. So that would be a way you could remind your dog um, 
uh, sometimes when I'm standing still, you stay close to me. Standing still doesn't always mean run away from me. So the last time we did this, um, I know some of you were here the last time. I have no idea what happened. I got cut off abruptly. Um, fortunately, it was at a, a good stopping spot. And um, those of you that just budgeted an hour are welcome to check out. I'm offering these um, for free. I wanted to get an idea of how they would work. I was looking back at some of my old material and really um, liking the content and wanting to revisit it with my students. So if you like the format, let me know. And um, they are free. There is a donation if you got value from it um, and want to donate. Um, a little something feel free be my guest it's on the website and I think it's on the the e email that went out I'm not hundred percent sure so um, but don't feel obligated and come back next time and um, feel free to give me some input and those of you that want to stay I'll stop the screen share and uh, clap eyeball we still have one question yeah okay yeah we still, we still have one question from John John is asking about what about using get it for the ball in the park? I will say get it when they're right over top of it. Um, uh, get it is again better than nothing. And you could release on get it. Um, the go on, go on is what I'm using in agility. So I like using stuff that, that strengthens my agility handling. Um, but I do say get it when they're right over top of the ball as well. So telling the dog to get it from the standstill is better than saying, planting that seed with the, but I would do both, go on, go on, go on. And I, in, you wanna notice if you get good at the park going, go on, go on, go on, go on, get it, is how I do it. I'm surprised the Border Collie didn't bark. Um, and then in competition, if you're going, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, and getting that, oh, that hysterical that causes most dogs to look back and say, are you okay back there? Heart attack, stress. So um, if you're practicing, notice if you're saying it different in competition or training than you are at the park. And I also don't go boring, go on, go on, go, go on, go, go. I don't do that. It's go on, go on, go on, go on with that nice drivey, Mm-mm, 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 yep. Uh, Nick has a question, so he's uh, unmuted. Yep. Hey, Sandy. Hi. Um, I just had a question about doing this exercise as a progression. You know, you start with the one jump where the handler is just totally still and trying to just do a, a pure positional collection around the, the jump. Do yep. you then progress on that, progress on that like, moving forward and, and slowing down to try to cue maybe around two number two or yeah three. you could add movement in there you could but the thing about adding that movement in is you want to have your spacing the i saw a seminar once mary ellen berry put on at a i was at a trainer's conference and she had incredible video of showing where dogs need the information so um there's a lot of upper level handlers in this in this group right now and yes you absolutely could the main thing is is that between the spacing of the jumps and if there's a tunnel at the other end or not that you are clear where your information zone is and i will cue the dog from behind as well so that what that setup there yes nick there's an enormous progression it could be quite complex it could involve um moving as soon as you immediately after release and then deselling on any jump you could have a slingshot um, tunnel at the far end and come back and choose any jump to do that decel do multiple you could have tunnels at two ends of a jump shoot and do multiple go on, go ons, go ons, and then pick a jump to do your decel cue on. And that's when your timing is gonna get good. But if you do that, you will be understanding, you'll be getting information from your dog. And what a lot of handlers do is they, they don't understand how early the dog needs those collection cues. You guys, it'll knock your socks off at how early they need it. Some, a lot of times in a jump shoot, it's on the landing on the jump before. I mean, it, it, so it's I would say you give yourself lots of space. I would not be doing this with a jump grid designed to produce bouncing. Did that answer your question, Nick? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and 
the progression is designed to, to show just that pure collection cue by position. Do you start blending in more cues as the dog? It depends on how far ahead, ahead I am. So if I did the, if I did the jump shoots in between two tunnels, I would, depending on how far the tunnel was and how far I sent and how soon I turned and headed back, I could be running the risk if I'm behind. So I decided, and, and it would also depend if my dog was not responding well to my verbal decel cues in recent competition. So I rely very, very, very heavily on verbal collection cues. And I use a verbal wrap every single time I want a verbal wrap unless I'm in a training scenario teaching, because I'll do the same drills with just the front cross, Nick, not with pure stopping. So the progression is, do you understand me if I just stop at the right time? Do you understand me if I rotate at the right time? Do you understand me? And I'll, I'll do a dig, dig, dig and keep moving. It's so on a, it's on a long basic collection cues more important or more clear to the dog by going through this. Say exercise. that again. It, it kind of emphasizes the, the basic collection cues like position without. Well, sometimes through. it's not in position. So I've taught the dog a verbal that I expect him to understand okay. early on its and own. In more cues, eye contact, verbal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shoulder I've, I've got, kind of thing, so. okay. right. So when I so when I walk a course and he's on full extension, five jumps headed straight to a tunnel, I'm pulling out all the stops. Yeah, right. Okay. But I also, if I'm ahead, I use my verbal cue because I want that verbal cue so strong. So the more he hears it, the better off I am. But if I'm combining all my rotation, my shoulder rotation, my eye contact, my verbal dig, 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 and my D cell 100% of the time in training, I'm not knowing which one's getting weaker. So I just right. visit them all separately from time to time. Right. That was kind of my point, and that's what this exercise can do is, is mm -hmm. make those, each one more clear. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and just, for, just for clarification, I got myself mixed up when I decided, okay, if I'm behind, I'm relying on verbals. If I'm ahead, I'm relying on physicals. And then I realized that that wasn't clarification enough because there's all this time where I'm not really behind and I'm not really ahead because I'm sort of at the dog's shoulder or at their neck or at their head. So then I just decided six feet in front of the dog is ahead. If I'm six feet, well far six feet ahead, I don't have to use verbals. Anything else in competition, in sequence and coursework, I'm combining the verbal with the physical cue. Great. Any other questions? Sandy, I have a question with limited space right now because we can't go out. Do you have any recommendations for like a three jump drill for D-cell or two jump? Uh, yeah, you can send around a tree and do a decel on a single jump. Um, do you have a yard? Yeah, I have a yard. I can do three jumps um, fairly straight with not much room at the end. Better when I curve things to get more room. Mm -hmm. but yeah, depending on how big and how fast your dog is, when you have limited space, but it, it would not hurt for you to do your D cell on your last jump. So you've got your dog on a stay. Now your wall, your wall is gonna help train your collection or your edge of your space will help train your collection. But you could have your jump in the middle of your space, your dog sitting as far away as you could, something he wants on the far side of the jump. And then I call that in one jump, two jump. In one jump, two jump is all on one jump and two jumps. I call that choose me. So it's like, are you gonna blow by my um, D cell on takeoff to steal that ball or um, good things to do with a uh, mark bucket too? Are you gonna steal the mark bucket? Are you gonna take what you want? Or are you gonna pick, a, are you gonna res, you know, respect me? But you'll be somewhat limited by, by momentum. Hey, thanks, I, I, I have enough room to put a tunnel it's like I'm in a square rather than a rectangle. 
<laughs> yeah. So I can you one. just need you just need the dog to be able to accelerate and collect up. And then the and then the hard part is if there's something that they want on the other side. And then the fun part is you put them through the tunnel, you put them over the jump, you say, get it. That's where I would throw in the get it, John. Tunnel jump, get it, tunnel jump, get it. And then tunnel jump, I'm stopped on takeoff. Are you gonna, And then you could take that thing away and help them. You could take that planted reinforcement away and help them. Thank you. Sure. Do we have some more? Anybody else going once? going twice next week we have four things uh four things to do when something goes wrong when things go wrong the four things to do um so uh come back next week at four o'clock i'll be here <laughs> no not shoot yourself pat <laughs> good to see everybody take care